Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second lecture of the cycle of lectures uh, organized by the Italian section of SPE and uh, Geolog. Uh, this this uh, second uh, uh, lecture will be given by Professor Alberto Guadagnini of Politecnico Milan. Uh, Alberto is, a, is the second time that I'm introducing Alberto this week <laughs> in one week, so <laughs> it seems that my main job is to introduce Alberto. <laughs> Alberto is a, is a friend of, an old friend of mine, and we worked together for many years. Alberto now is a head of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the Polytechnic of Milan, and at the same time is also professor at the University of Arizona. That's correct. Huh? Um, Alberto is a very active professor. He's one of the most active professors that uh, I've ever seen uh, in my life. Uh, he has a lot of activities. His, his uh, research activities mainly focused uh, on subsurface uh, fluid, uh, fluid, uh, fluid dynamics. But uh, uh, he's, uh, say, working uh, in many different uh, areas, uh, including, obviously, oil uh, and gas. Alberto, then, uh, I think that uh, will tell you something about uh, uh, his acti uh, research activity during his presentation, his lecture. He has uh, written in a huge number of papers, very good quality papers, uh, more than 150, and uh, is also executive uh, editor of the uh, uh, Journal of Hydrology and uh, Earth System Science, uh, and associate editor of the journals Water Resource Research and the Stochastic Environmental Research and Risk Assessment. Uh, Alberto has uh, many cooperation going uh, with uh, uh, di different, uh, also with different industries, uh, including uh, uh, ENI and including obviously Geolog. Today, the presentation, uh, the, uh, the subject of the presentation of today is a very hot topic. Uh, is uh, is uh, uh, concerning the impact, uh, the environmental impact uh, of uh, unconventional activity. Uh, in particular, uh, the, 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 say, the problems connected to uh, fracking. And, is, uh, and Alberto will, uh, will speak about a project that is uh, in, uh, in the frame of the, the activity of uh, European Horizon 2020. If uh, we attended the last uh, lecture uh, 15 days ago with Professor Luterotti, also Professor Luterotti uh, presented the project uh, founded by uh, Horizon 2020. So we continue in this, uh, in this uh, say, in this contest, uh, uh, speaking about uh, projects that are founded by the European community. Alberto, I leave the floor to Alberto. Uh, please. Thank you very much. And I'm thank not, you I'm very, not sure. I, I'm not and sure and thank you very much, obviously, for being here today and giving this presentation. Um, thanks, Mario, for the nice invitation. Thanks, everybody, for being here and suffering with me for the next 40 minutes or so. And... Uh, uh, I would just like to start by introducing uh, the, very briefly the, the research group. We deal with the uh, flow and transport processes in porous media, and it's basically a research group which is formed by people from two departments. My department, which is civil and environmental engineering, and energy department. There's the head of the energy department here, uh, Professor Fabio Insoli. And uh, you see some faces of PhDs and postdocs uh, who, are, uh, who are currently working in the group. So I'm not going too much into the details of uh, what we are doing in uh, the group precisely. And uh, I will uh, just work uh, or just focus the presentation on some aspects of the research pro re recent research projects uh, that we are dealing with uh, in the framework of the Horizon H2020 program. And so, Basically, the two keywords are going to be uh, shale gas and groundwater, so aquifer systems. And so I will start with something that everybody knows, uh, and I will finish uh, with something that I do not know. So uh, just a brief introduction to the, pro to the project. The project is called FRAC Risk, and it is related to um, the assessment of the environmental footprint uh, and specifically probabilistic risk assessment of shale gas operations uh, on aquifer bodies. So I'm talking about freshwater aquifer systems uh, and possible impacts that there can be. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is going to be mostly methodological. So the kind of methodology that we have set up in uh, the project. Then if you're interested in more details about 
other activities that we have in the project, uh, well, we'll be more than happy to discuss them with you at the very end of the presentation. Just to give an idea, we are talking about a consortium of uh, 13 uh, members, uh, including also Penn State uh, University, so the Marcellus Center in, um, in Pennsylvania with whom we have had and we are actually having a nice collaboration and uh, due to their extensive experience in, uh, shale gas, with shale gas. Like I said, something that everybody knows. Uh, so we are talking about uh, uh, shale gas. This is more or less the scale of the problem that we are interested in. And uh, we have a fractured formation, actually shale formation at some depth. We are trying to recover some gas or oil, and uh, the key point is to assess the impact of what we do down here to quality of groundwater around here. That's the key point. So um, not delving too much about the history of uh, hydraulic fracturing. Uh, I'm just showing uh, a few maps about what happens, uh, for example, in, uh, in the US. So this is the Marsalus. Marcellus formation, and this is an animation of the number of wells, frac fracking wells, which have been established during the course of the past 15 years. So the red dots are, well, the wells which were available, which were drilled between 2004 and 2005, when the formation was actually started to be developed. And then we move on, and this is more or less the density of wells that I'm talking about over, over that particular area. Uh, well, there are two maps about the Marcellus Shale. We are talking about a formation which is a little shy of 3,000 meters, three kilometers below ground, with a thickness uh, which goes between, uh, I don't know, a couple of meters to about 80 meters. This is a type of development uh, which is done in uh, that formation in terms of wells. Uh, and uh, if we think that we are talking about uh, uh, possibilities of the use of uh, shale gas energy on in this type of formation, uh, well, if we consider what happens in Europe, uh, well, we can have, uh, and we actually did quite some more to establish some baseline of potential basis, uh, basins uh, in EU, well, within different geological settings, uh, where potentially there can be the possibility of uh, deploying uh, uh, hydraulic fracturing techniques. Um, not entering into any discussions about uh, legal legislation arguments uh, and protocols about these sites, that's not the point of the presentation. The point is to start by showing that the topic is indeed uh, of very actual concern and practical concern in uh, um, all, over, all over the world. Like I said, something that everybody knows, uh, there are several stages in uh, hydraulic fracturing. Uh, and if we consider the production, which depending on, the for depending on the type of formation and the type of technology that we use can range between five to 50 years, uh, we have a couple of stages uh, which need the license, okay? You need to somehow uh, obey to certain prerequisites uh, which might be well or not well established in, in our systems. And the key point is to assess what happens uh, during these stages, uh, which are uh, shooting of explosives. Uh, I'm using uh, hard terms, uh, terminologies, just on purpose, okay? Shooting of explosives. Uh, to break the tubing and penetrate into the rock, uh, water injection with propant and additives, uh, whatever it means, whatever they are, with different chemical compositions, uh, and then the gas recovery. And the point is, um, what can be some issues of concern with all this setting of operations? That's the key point. Well, there can be several issues of concern, actually. We can call it concern, which we, we can call it consideration. That's a different story. So I'm going to focus on uh, uh, groundwater contamination and uh, the type of methodology that can be, or that at least we uh, set up, to come up with some hard numbers uh, in terms of uh, risk assessment of groundwater quality due to this type of operations. Uh, so I'm not entering uh, 
into other issues uh, which are related to impacts on soil, landscape, road transportation. Uh, so just to have an idea of the way la the landscape nowadays looks like in Pennsylvania, you can see that picture. That's a hydraulic fracturing pad, a well pad which is over there. I'm not talking about noise of transportation during the construction um, and uh, atmospheric emissions, uh, problems uh, or issues related to the ownership of the mineral resources. I'm simply focusing uh, on uh, the idea of groundwater contamination, the point of groundwater contamination. That's the only thing that I'm going to deal with today. Uh, groundwater contamination, uh, which can come, uh, well, from different, uh, or from, a, from a variety of possibilities in the system. First of all, water availability. Before, even before talking about uh, uh, water, water contamination. It really depends on context and on the way you convey the message in terms of water availability. Well, we are talking about uh, something like uh, 30,000 cubic meters per well, which is not so huge as a water requirement. We are talking about irrigation of, uh, I don't know, five <coughs> hectares field, which might seem a lot or might not, might not seem a lot. But let's say that there is one well per square kilometer per year. Then uh, we do the math, and we're talking about 30 millimeters, millimeters per year. So it really depends on how you present the issue. If you talk about 30 millimeters per year, it sounds huge. Well, it's 5% in a country like Spain. I'm talking about arid or Mediterranean climate of the rainfall or 15% of streaming. So it really depends if you present it like this or like this, the issue. And I'm not even entering into a debate like this. The point is water availability. And then, of course, how long is the production? And uh, just be aware that our perception is always linked to the way that all these kinds of results are exposed. So this said, uh, I'm entering into the topic of risk assessment. And uh, this is basically the natural system that we are considering, which is more or less a mess. It is like this. And we have to make sense of what happens in the subsurface with a system like this. So we can start working, and we can start deconstructing the system just to build down the natural complexity of the system, trying to organize it into a set of properties well-defined or more or less well-defined, uh, trying to, to provide some combinations of these guys here, and uh, try to identify high-risk combination of these guys. I didn't say what these guys represent here. I'm going to, go, I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. Okay? I can identify high-risk combinations, uh, some undesirable event that I would like to prevent or that it is likely to occur. Uh, and then I'm talking about consequences uh, and what happens to the receptor. Okay? Uh, in this approach, uh, I start from studying the natural system from the beginning, uh, and then at the very end, uh, I try to come up with the consequences. Or, this is typically called a bottom-up approach, or you can, call, you can use a top-down approach, and you can start the other way around. So first, you try to identify the type of risk that you're interested in, and then you try to deconstruct the system and come up with the min path of minimum resistance, which means minimum set of elements uh, according to which you can characterize your system to quantify the risk associated to that, uh, per to that particular undesirable effect, which is the approach that we use in our system. <coughs> it is well known in the industry, nothing new, like I said. The point is how to conceptualize this in such a complex environment. That's one of the key points, okay? So what we did was to uh, propose a, a risk-based approach which is grounded on the concept, on the concept, well, well-known concept of source, pathway, a target. So we identify a target, an undesirable effect, and there is risk if there is a pathway which connects a source which we can identify with a given target. So we deconstruct the problem into a set of basic events, and then we quantify each one of them and we compose them to come up with a number which gives me 
a quantification of the risk. That's the key idea. Okay? Well, which is okay, so it means uh, that we need to identify what we call source. We need to identify physical features, elements, processes that characterize the source of, contam of contamination. When I say contamination, uh, uh, you can see it as a negative connotation or just as a neutral connotation. Again, that's not the point. The point is uh, to use some wording uh, to identify what I'm talking about. Then you need to identify pathways in the system, and you need to know how to identify them. I'm not entering into measuring devices or uh, characterization of the subsurface into this point. Like I said, it's mostly methodological. And then uh, you come up with the, with the identification of, of the target. For each of these compartments, uh, so for this, each of these <coughs> uh, sets of quantities, well, you can define a list of features, so properties of the system. You can identify events that can happen, and you can identify processes which can be either natural or anthropogenically induced or anthropogenically favored, which needs to be characterized with, in some way. And the way that I'm talking about is, of course, experimental and modeling-based. Okay? So if I destructure the point, the problem like this, then I can start by identifying my main risks, which can be, for example, my main, let me say, negative events or adverse effects, which can be pollution caused by substances released during the exploration, materials released during the preparation, loss of fracturing fluid, and so on, several sets of events. For each one of them, I will find a proper compartment in the system. I will link it to pathways and then sources, and I will try to join them through some sort of coherent probabilistic framework and uh, modeling and modeling framework. That these are the key points. So for example, I identify a threat, and for a given threat, I will identify some elements uh, which, can be, which needs to be quantified because uh, they are going to drive uh, the type of threat that I identify. For example, the strength uh, or the thickness of the overburden, that can be one. Distribution of properties, so hydraulic conductivity, porosity, type of geomaterials, geomechanical properties of the system. Uh, events, typical events can be fluid pressure increase during, uh, during injection and then processes, which I need to somehow translate uh, into some mathematical formulation. For example, geomechanical processes, reactive transport processes, simple advective processes, and so on, multi-phase flow, and so on. Once I do this, I have more or less a clear framework according to which I can quantify some probability that something bad happens. Okay. And then, of course, I'm not entering into the details of a classical bow tie, bow tie approach because you already, know, you already know it, everybody knows it. The point is that this kind of approach is very flexible and can be used in a traditional risk assessment protocol. Note that as compared to other, uh, let me say, industrially based uh, probabilistic risk assessment uh, protocols. Here we are dealing with natural systems, and so the degree of complexity is uh, even higher, which means that either we destructure the problem, I'm not saying this way, which is, I'm not saying that this is the ex an exclusive way. The point is that we need to destructure it into a set of coherent uh, basic elements. If we don't do this, uh, then, uh, uh, well, I'm not sure what to say I mean, uh, about, the, about the understanding of the process. Once we, once we do this, we understand that we can have multiple sources, and so we focus maybe on one source at a time or on a combination of sources depending on, and we are driven by our perceived threat or hazardous event. Uh, we can have multiple pathways, and we can focus on only on the relevant pathways, if we can identify relevant path pathways, or on all pathways which are, which are existing. And then we can assess what happens to the receptors. We can have a variety of receptors. It can be the, the quality of the water at a particular well. 
It can be the quality of the water in a particular river. It can be the ability, for example, of the soil uh, to provide uh, nutrients to, the, to, ve to vegetation. Depending on my target, then I go back during, along this chain and uh, I try to quantify the links between all these terms. So, uh, in the end, uh, the idea is, of course, uh, to embed monitoring and uh, data collections in each of these compartments to constrain, uh, the to constrain our estimates of the probability that something bad or something good, you never know, or something good can happen in the system. Maybe we can also use it to come up with recommendations. Let me call them science-based recommendations. Uh, in a unifying framework, uh, because the framework is exactly the same for all things, uh, then you can uh, build it with, into the, with different modules. <coughs> so that you can finally come up with ways uh, of communicating uh, to the general public, uh, to the industry, to the university, because we need to be communicating a lot of things also in terms of universities, and to regulators. So we focused in this project on uh, several, uh, let me call them elementary uh, or unit blocks of all these chains. We call them uh, uh, focused scenarios, which are related to the source, to the to pathways, and to the target. And I'm going to show you just, well, first of all, a set of the type of basic events that we considered, and then just a very simple and streamlined ideal application just to show the point uh, or to demonstrate the point. Then we can talk about more complex applications. Okay? So, of course, uh, we started identifying all these basic elements, uh, which are the conceptual scenarios that we used in terms of source, and we consider hydromechanical behavior of the of fracture formations. So we have a series of works which are concerned with the formation of fractures. There are uh, base, uh, which, is, which can be related also to micro seismicity. So basic processes of sources uh, as a function of the type of target that we want to consider. Um, then we go to the scale of the shale, for, we go up to the scale of the shale formation and we can have uh, fluid flow in fractures uh, and pressure migrations in the pressure migration in the system chemical transport uh, so we can go into the overburdening and so these are all sources uh, that we can consider and then different types of pathways and targets so as a pathway you, you can have a fault zone uh, you can have leakage through an abandoned or through an active wells uh, so you classify them, and then you reach the, uh, the scale of, the, of your aquifer system. Now, once you do this, uh, it's very clear that you are uh, maybe oversimplifying the problem. On another side, you have a clear destructuring of the system. You can allow yourself to study each one of them independently. And then the, the key part is to find a way to link all of them. So to study this part and find uh, the input which goes to this scale, then the input which goes to this scale, and so on, in a reasonable, well, in a theoretically robust way. OK. Uh, of course, uh, each of these scales uh, can be related uh, to a given threat. So you can construct your, uh, uh, you can construct a diagrams of this type here identifying tier one or tier two scenarios, which then maybe deserve or do not deserve more detailed field studies. So in the project, we, I would say that we arrived to tier two so that we can provide, at least, well, we think we can provide indications uh, about the need or not to perform additional and more, um, let me say, it's not fair to say more robust, let me say deeper studies, okay? <clears throat> well, 
In order to do that, uh, you, need, you need to acquire uh, uh, quite a broad spe spectrum of knowledge, of knowledge. So you need to have uh, actually a reliable and available database uh, of baseline situations. So we compiled key environmental baseline data from EU and US sites, which are publicly available on, uh, on, our, on, uh, on our website. Uh, you, can, you need to, con well, we constructed uh, a thermohydromechanic -hydro uh, classification of faces uh, in uh, different uh, reservoirs that we, w that we were, uh, that we were uh, dealing with. From those, uh, we took samples. Uh, we samples of rocks and samples of, fr of fracking fluid. We analyzed them in the laboratory. And uh, we analyzed also problems associated with uh, air emissions or methane emissions in, uh, in the US. We worked uh, for the identification of the sources. Uh, but once again, all these works were related to given pieces of the system, which were then put together. That was the methodological approach. So we had groups working on the characterization of sources, groups working on the characterization of models at one scale, on the characterization of models at another scale, and then integration of the models of different scales, and comparison against field data. That was the idea. That's why we were 13. Uh, well, we worked, of course, on, uh, well, on several things that I'm not going to, that I'm not going to mention in, uh, in the talk. Okay? But we had a comprehensive analysis of, of all the elements. Sorry. So now what I'm talking just as a simple example, I'm going to show you what can be done with, uh, to couple source and pathway to reach a target. So what it means coupling the two. Okay? Well, what it means? Uh, what it means means to write a set of partial differential equations. It means to solve them, <laughs> and then it means to look at the results. Okay. All jokes aside, okay, that's a way of putting it. All jokes aside, it means uh, well analyzing all the physical processes which happened here. So how fractures can be firm, uh, formed, how they can propagate, and whether they can reach the overburden. So you integrate that knowledge. Uh, and you link this scale with this scale here. And so in the examples that I'm going to show you, okay, basically we are going to have already the worst case scenario where we have fractured, which are already formed, and they can reach the overburden. And then we are going to consider this type of pathway, and we're going to have a fault, which is at some distance, which we do not know precisely, from these regions where the fracture have already reached the, the overburden. Now, and we would like to come up with a probability distribution of mass, for example, of methane, which can reach the overlying aquifer system. That's the key point, okay? I'm not entering into uh, the structure of the mathematical models that we use, because that's not the point. The key element is to recognize that I'm talking about, or we are talking about risk, and we are talking about probability distributions because we have uncertainty. We have uncertainty in something. We can have uncertainty in our conceptual understanding of the system. And for the sake of simplicity, I assume that we perfectly know the functioning of the system in this presentation. Uh, while in the work that we did, uh, we considered also the effect of uncertainty in our conceptual understanding of the system. Once, uh, to me, to have a perfect, uh, let me say, certainty on the conceptual functioning of the system means to perfectly know the mathematical model driving processes in the system and to perfectly know the type of processes that I'm considering. Nevertheless, even as I know my mathematical model, well, I have uncertainty in a lot of other things. Model parameters, boundary conditions, initial conditions, uh, at least, okay? So, uh, these type of models uh, are actually, 
as you know, quite heavy to run, especially if you have uh, uh, geomechanical, if you include the geomechanical part, if you include the reactive transport, if you're talking about multi-phase, uh, you have quantities which are not well defined, uh, even though we might think that they are well defined, uh, for example, relative permeabilities and other quantities like that. So what I'm considering uh, is the effect, uh, in this case, uh, of my perfect knowledge of the system, of the model uh, governing the processes taking place in my system and imperfect knowledge of the parameters associated with these, with these processes. Okay? Uh, these parameters can be quite a lot. Okay? And there are several ways to tackle this problem. One, uh, you can work in a Monte Carlo framework, which is what we are going to do. Very simple. You can decide to run, for example, your full system model, what, one million times, 100,000 times, um, do not even want to talk about the number of times which are required. It's not a well-posed problem, but that's a different story, okay? Uh, it might require a huge amount of time, so we resort uh, to a combination of full system models, so our complete system model, reduced complexity models, uh, and then we rely on reduced complexity models uh, in a probabilistic risk assessment framework to come up with the way the uncertainty in our model parameters uh, propagate to the uncertainty of the output uh, from this guy here, and then they propagate to the uncertainty in the input to this parameter here, which then reflects to the uncertainty in the output of this guy here, and then propagates uh, into the uh, transport uh, of contaminants in the surface aquifer. These are the key ideas. Okay. So, like I said, very simple. The geometry that we consider is just extremely simple, simply because I want to show the methodology. So we have a region where I, I have already performed my hydraulic fracturing, and I have fractures which can be vertical, subvertical. I, I don't care. I have a bunch, of, a bunch of fractures. I don't know how many. I have some spacing, which is a random variable, which I do not know, all these fractures, because I cannot know all of it. I have an injection, uh, well, injection, flow, injection rate from the well. And these guys here actually tend to uh, provide maybe yes, maybe not, some methane into the overboard. This methane can find its way across the fault, and then it can reach the, the, overlying, the overlying aquifer. So what I'm using, and the overlying aquifer is just, at least in this example, is just as simple as, as, simple as it can be, just to show, how, just to show a schematics. Uh, note, sorry, note that in order to uh, model all these kind of processes, even if I consider each window separately, I need to solve reactive transport problem, uh, fracture generation problem, uh, maybe discrete fracture model for two phase, uh, multi-component flow. I have to solve all these kind of things. And I'm not even showing uh, the, the mathematical models that, that we are using for that. Let's assume that we can do it, okay? Good. Uh, now that we have all the machinery in place, uh, of course, this is a very simple, uh, a very simple setup, but it's just a, an example of what one can do for a tier two or a tier one risk assessment problem. Just simplify your problem, see what kind of risk uh, comes out of it, and then make a decision on that basis. So, <clears throat> so I'm talking about, uh, sorry, I'm talking about the source and a pathway. So what I want to do is to join the two types of scenario and see what happens at the outcome of a pathway. So whatever reaches my, uh, under my, my uh, shallow groundwater system. So like I said, I know exactly my mathematical models, which can be a bunch of partial differential equations. Each one of those are associated with a bunch of parameters, which I consider as unknown quantities, and I can model, for example, we, we took a very simple way of modeling it. It's a identically distributing in the, in the independent random variables, and we take a uniform distribution just for the sake of the example, which is very simple, okay? You can have parameters 
of your model which are associated only with the source and parameters which are associated both, sorry, which are associated both with the source and with the pathway scenario. For example, uh, to solve for the source and to come up with an estimate of the mass of methane which reaches the, the overburden, well, then you need to have an idea of at least, let me say, the thickness of the overburden, which is also a parameter for this case. You, can, you should at least have an idea of the, can I say, the anisotropy ratio between horizontal and vertical permeabil permeability of the overburden, which then you need to use here. So some parameters appear in both compartments, which means, uh, unfortunately, sorry, which means, unfortunately, that uh, there is a little bit more of complexity in the system. So one thing that you can, uh, uh, that you can think to do is to consider uncertainty in all your parameters in the source and then define your output, mass of methane which migrates to the overburden and come up with a probability distribution function, a probability density from the output. Well, since we have some parameters which are shared with the pathway, unfortunately, <laughs> with the underlying uh, system, unfortunately, the PDF, the probability density function of your uh, of the output from the source uh, is going to be joined, jo uh, is going to be a joint probability function with the parameters uh, uh, which are shared by the two scenarios. So you need to characterize those. And once you use all these ingredients, uh, then you come up with the output with the probability density function of the output. That's the idea, okay? Now, I do not wish to enter into the machinery of how you do that. From a numerical standpoint, uh, it's more or less difficult uh, depending on uh, uh, the requirements of the models that you or the models that you use. The point is, it can be done. Once I do that, then you put everything together in a unique tool, which is uh, a tool that we prepared in uh, in the project. And uh, then you can relate uh, the different scenarios uh, through, sorry, through these guys here. So this is the key to relate the different scenarios. So you can treat them independently, then you calculate uh, or you estimate the joint probability distributions uh, between parameters which are shared across the scenarios and output variables. Actually, we're talking about output from the one scenarios and input to the other scenarios. And this is the, one of the key ingredients which goes to the, other, to the other scenarios. If you do it like this, you can work separately, okay? You need to be careful about the input of the, of the, of the difference of the, in the chain of the scenarios. And that's the point. This is time consuming, okay? And uh, since it is time consuming, uh, here there is a summary of all the steps that I, that, I just out, that I just outlined. So we are here, okay? Now we have to deal with, uh, now let, let's say that we are satisfied with the general idea and we need to do the calculations. And we cannot do it in the sense that, actually no, it's not true that we cannot do it. Maybe it is going to take a month. So maybe if it takes a month, it's unfeasible. So the idea is to use uh, reduced complexity models. You can use any type of reduced complexity model that you wish and that you're comfortable with. With You can use Gaussian emulators. For example, we decided to use something which is called polynomial chaos expansion reduced models, which is extremely simple to use. And then you can analyze uh, through either global or local sensitivity analysis techniques, uh, the impact of the different parameters uh, on the probability distribution function of the output. Okay? Now, what does it mean uh, to train a surrogate model? Well, it means uh, starting from a surface like this, uh, which is the result of, the, of your full model, coming up with the, reduce, with, the reduce complexi with the reduced complexity, let me say smoother or lower dimensional uh, surface, and then use this one your, in your risk assessment, probabilistic risk assessment procedures. Uh, it can cut down the, the operational time uh, dramatically. In this case, it is a polynomial, so it's just a matter of minutes to come up with, well, minutes, maybe 10 minutes to come up with probability distributions, which are 
at least to me, which are robust enough for tier two assessment, risk assessment, and to have an idea of the type of probabilities that we are talking about. And then there is the point of uh, uh, defining uh, the effect uh, of, all param of, of your uncertain parameters in the systems. There are several techniques to do that, and it all boils down uh, to come up with uh, a way of quantifying uh, the relative importance of parameter A, parameter B, or parameter C to key statistics of your output. In general, since we are interested uh, in uh, extreme values, uh, which can have also, which can be characterized by low probabilities, then we are interested in the whole probability distributions, which can be de-structured into several moments. I can have zero order moment, which is the mean, second order moment, the variance, and so on, and the fourth order moment, uh, which provides you a definition of the weight of the tails of the distribution. So what we did, we defined indices, or metrics, which are slightly, well, they are comprehensive and they uh, enlarge the concept uh, provided by the classical Sobol indices, which comes from an ANOVA decomposition of your system, and uh, can provide information about how each of the uncertain parameters of the system uh, can affect the shape of the probability distribution of the output. Note that since I'm talking about uh, uncertain parameters of the system, then if I'm interested in some parts of the probability distribution, then it might be that some parameters are important, some others are not important. And how do I use this information? Well, they can give me indication about how to prioritize my efforts in characterizing the system depending on my target. So in principle, all parameters are important to understand the functionality of the system. In practice, depending on my target, some it might be worth that I direct some efforts in characterizing some parameters. It might not be worth for that particular target. That's the idea. So uh, I have prepared a series of slides uh, to define what are the parameters. Uh, to be honest, uh, I'm not sure that the point is to show uh, the details of how all the parameters are, uh, are considered. So if you don't mind, I'm going to skip the next uh, 900 slides, uh, okay, and uh, go directly. Well, we use them in several contexts in this part here. We studied seawater intrusion problems, uh, laboratory scale uh, scenarios, uh, well, these kind, this kind of scenarios, and we even applied them recently to in the context of geophysical measurements by to assess gravimetric variations during pumping tests in a confined aquifer, which we can now drive, for example. So just to give you a sense of the type of results that, that you can come up with from the application of this type of analysis. Um, I consider it is not important, I mean, uh, uh, at least for the purpose of this, um, of this seminar, the type of parameters that I'm considering uh, as uncertain, as the output of the problem, so what, what it leads to. For example, in this case, uh, we decided uh, that our uncertain parameters were the injection rate during fracking operation, which was varying uh, between a given range. This is, well, of course it is not uncertain because you impose uh, the injection rate. The point is, uh, well, if I want to start uh, uh, doing my operation, which one is the best that I can use? Okay, so I start from a range, and then I can come up with a quantification of the risk associated with the particular choice that I make. Associated which? The terminology associated with the particular choice is tantamount saying conditional to the particular choice that I make. These are the points. So the distance between the fracture that I use, uh, the anisotropy of the overburden, uh, the, and actually, since we are using in this example the Van Genuchten model for the, for the capillary pressure, uh, one of the parameters of the Van Genuchten model. <coughs> in the pathways, and then we come up, uh, we are interested in uh, the meta influx and the, pressure at the over, and the pressure at the bottom of the overburden from the first scenario. Those are characterized by a probability distribution, and they are the input to this scenario here. These are the key points, okay? You applied, we applied the methodology and you can come up, for example, with something like this. 
uh, very simple. On the horizontal axis, uh, you have one, two, three, four, and five uncertain parameters, which are normalized between their minimum and their maximum values. Each one of these curves uh, represents the average value, so the expected value, the mean, or the predicted value of the mass flux of methane, which is conditional to a given parameter. For example, the blue curve represents the way the mean value of the methane flux depends on the flux, the injection flux, when all other parameters are varied. The, the purple curve represents the expected value of the methane flux as a function of the residual saturation when all the other parameters are varying. So I fix one of these parameters. So for example, for this case, I fix the density of the fractures at a given, at a given value. I vary all other parameters. I have a probability distribution, and this is of the methane flux, and this is the mean. Okay? And you can see several things. Of course, everything uh, has been uh, obtained through the use of the reduced complexity model of the, of the surrogate model in a matter of minutes. Before that, you need to construct the surrogate model. And you can see, and you can see for example, as expected, of course, okay, as expected, if you have a high injection flux, then you, can, you have a high expected value of, the, of your method mass, mass flux. Of course it was expected. I chose this example on purpose because at least we can have an idea of what we can have as, as results. Uh, at the same time, if I consider the, the Van Genuchten alpha, well, to be honest, uh, it doesn't impact much, at least the expected value. So if I'm interested in a prediction, I'm not saying you can use it whatever value that you want, especially because I'm live, but I'm saying more or less. Okay, that's the key. These are key messages that you can get from, uh, from, this, from this type of results. The same goes uh, for, uh, for variance, uh, which means that you can have distributions which are very spread. For example, if you have, uh, if you look at this curve here, and you consider residual methane saturation in the system, which is very high, and you know that it is very high, then you already know that considering this particular model, then the PDF, the probability density of the output, is going to be very compact. Okay? So it means that the, that the mean is going to be a, okay. I'm using the terminology reliable predictor, whatever it means. The point is that the variance is, is low. Okay? And you, can, you have the opposite, for example, by considering the low residual methane saturation. If you have a low residual methane saturation, and you know it because you have measured it, if all other parameters are, ra are random, then be sure that, that you're going to have a broad distribution of, uh, of fluxes. It, at the same time, with the tails. In this case, for example, high residual methane saturations, uh, well, basically have no tails in the PDF. So the extreme values, uh, well, there are no extreme values in this case, in this particular, in this example. Once you do this, uh, then uh, you can check the full, the full distribution of the system, conditional to given parameters. And you can see what are the parameters which drive the behavior at the tails, which drive the variance, the degree of compactness of the distribution. And ultimately, you can actually calculate probabilities, which you can then f feed into your risk matrix. Uh, these are type of results that you, that you can have, okay? Which is, for example, in this case, uh, the probability density function of the mass of methane that I can have, and then you can come up with different quantiles of this probability density. And then they can give you a risk, which is quantifiable in the system. Then, of course, you need to make sure that your surrogate model is, um, is good which means that if I look at a scatter plot like this, uh, on the horizontal and on the vertical axis, uh, I have actually the same quantity, which is computed with the full model and with the surrogate model, depending on the type of uh, complexity of the system, you might have a good or a bad agreement. I'll let you judge if it is good or bad. On the basis of this analysis, uh, the point is you need to be very careful in the type of surrogate or reduced complexity model that you, that you select.
Okay? And there is no universal recipe, and that might take some time to find some adjustments. Okay? So, for example, in this case, uh, you can identify that the key parameter driving uh, the mean, uh, the mean flux of methane, uh, was the permeability and isotropy of the overburden. And it's just a solid output uh, of, this type of, uh, of this type of analysis. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, the generality of universality of the results. I'm talking about the methodology, which is shown with a simple example. Okay? You can play with probability distributions. For example, in this case, it is very clear that if I condition, so if I know exactly the degree of anisotropy or the permeability of the overburden, then I can have very different and very compact shapes of the probability distribution of my, uh, or my methane mass. Well, as a matter of fact, here we are plotting 1 minus the, probab the probability distribution, which is the survivor function. Okay. If you don't know it, uh, well, you might be happy or not in having a huge uncertainty. The point is you're going to have a huge uncertainty, and unless you characterize that particular quantity, well, you're going to live with that uncertainty. But at least you know what you have to do if you want to reduce that uncertainty to a, manage to a, uh, to a manageable system. And then you can include it uh, in, uh, in risk-based uh, protocols, and you can come up with corrective actions, which are based on solid, uh, on solid numbers. And I would say that I will end with uh, this slide, where I show all the members of the, of the project and uh, the type of activities that we, that we have done and that we are doing in the project is almost finished, this part here. I thank you for your attention. I'm not sure if I'm over time, but in any case, I thank you for your attention. And I would be more than happy to take any questions that Mario can answer to. Thank you. <laughs>Just to break the ice, a couple of questions, if I can. I have no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> the first question is a quite simple question. Is, uh, do you think that at the end of this exercise, it would be possible to, to define some thumb uh, rules uh, to define where the risk could be higher for contamination or aquifer? In, uh, uh, in other words, it, it could be, uh, we, you have to go case by case, uh, or is, would it be possible uh, to define some uh, rules where the risk could be higher. Well, Se and the second okay. question, uh, the second question is, uh, I saw some similarities uh, with what is, the, is uh, with the problem of CO2 storage. Yes. Because, uh, you know, in this case, you have fracking, in the case of storage, uh, you have, can have uh, a, an overpressure. Uh, you think that the same approach could be applied and you have, uh, do you plan to apply the same approach for CO2 storage? So let me first, Answer to the second one. The short answer is yes, uh, and actually, uh, I'm going to say it anyway. We didn't invent the, the methodology. I mean, you can find it. Uh, I mean, it's very common in industry, this type of methodology. You can, it's very flexible. Uh, we applied it actually recently with, uh, with Alberto in a master thesis project, which was very su successful uh, to the uh, blowout uh, to analyze the risk associated with, with blowout of, um, of deep wells. Okay? So the answer is yes. The point uh, is that we are dealing with uh, systems uh, which are much more complex than other industrial or engineered system, systems. So to me, the complexity here uh, is to come up with, uh, can I say, reasonable ways uh, of breaking down the natural systems into basic events and then on your ability to conceptualize them. So, to go back to your first question, uh, I would say that I'm not sure what you mean by general, but if you have, if you can classify, for example, aquifers according to, uh, or geological systems according to predefined uh, sets of quantities, then yes, there might be general conclusions. Uh, if not, uh, I don't see any, to be honest, I don't see any problem because at least the methodology is as general as it can be. Now, 
the question is to identify for the particular system where you need to direct your efforts uh, as a function of the question that you're asking. That's the, the nice part that I would see with this one. And then uh, you can come up, uh, well, there are some technicalities, but these are, um, these are simply more or less simple, I mean, to overcome. Was I, more or less, was I clear enough yes. with that? Thank you. Questions? No questions? So thank you very much indeed for your it was a pleasure. for your presentation. Very, very good, uh, excellent presentation. And I leave the floor to Alberto for some comments uh, from SPE. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, uh, ah, we, we have to finish uh, by clapping our hands, so we cannot leave it like this. You? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <Okay. laughs> thank you very much. So a couple of, uh, of comments which came into my mind while listening to, to, to the presentation. Uh, first of all, you may have heard, you surely have heard about all the, um, let's say, troubles created by Cambridge Analytica in using uh, Facebook data for the elections, or you may have be, be very familiar with the fact that you take a picture and uh, Facebook uh, may, puts a, a square around your face and tells you who you are. Actually, all these uh, methods are behind also all those, uh, those techniques. So actually what happens is that behind the scenes, mm -hmm. all these technologies, despite the fact that they seem so complex, actually, because it's a very complex thing, but when you transform this into a real product, then you can see the immense power that it has. And also the, the fear that it can create uh, if applied, misapplied, let's yeah. say, from a certain point of view. So actually, uh, in the industry now we have the uh, digital twin concept. I don't know if you ever heard about this. The digital twin concept is that we have a plant, but we also have a twin of the plant in digital form, which means a sort of a simulator which creates uh, uh, the same effect of the plant. And the future of the oil industry, of, of many industry, industries, may be to have a very complex object, the digital twin of this object, and take decision based on what the digital twin does. Uh, if you do not master very, very deeply these techniques, the digital twin cannot exist at all. So actually, in, from many points of view, the future of, of the oil industry in the effectiveness of digital techniques is associated to mastering all of these. And, and of course, mastering this is difficult because <laughs> it's a difficult topic, but actually it, uh, it is immensely power when used in, in the appropriate way. So it's a suggestion to deepen your, your understanding of these topics, even if they look like a little bit scary. Uh, the last... Um, comment I wanted to, to make uh, is this one. Um, uh, this uh, uh, contamination of the aquifer from fracturing operations has, has been, uh, you know very well, has been very controversial. I mean, there has been a lot of uh, hype in the United States, but also in Italy uh, in the last referendum related to the fact that the oil industry is creating a lot of troubles, is destroying the waters, and so on. Uh, here we are at the level of, uh, of uh, very... My mistake. My mistake. I did something that I shouldn't have done. Okay. <laughs> no, no problem. Uh, it's been at the level, uh, uh, let's say, of very deep scientific understanding. Uh, but uh, as an oil industry, we, we also need to do something else, which is find ways to communicate exactly. these concepts uh, in such a way that many people can understand them. Because, uh, because uh, actually, uh, we need to get deep, but at some point, uh, we need to come up again, uh, not being deep water, let's say, but on the surface, uh, and try to be very simple and try to create very straightforward messages. And of course, we need to let people understand that we do things very seriously and we are not uh, pirates. Uh, and we actually can control the risks, and we do a lot of analysis on the risks. But actually, this is technically true, but sometimes we have difficulties in convincing people that this is true. So uh, something that we really need to address, and that as SPE we need to address this, is to be more, uh, let's say, not, not more genuine, but let's say easier 
for, for many people to actually understand the value of what we are doing. You know? So it's, a, it's really a challenge for us because we are technical people, we, we are very deep in what we do. Uh, it's uh, very difficult for us, for me first and for any one of us, to be very clear and communicated to non-experts what we are doing. So it's a path that we have to take. And, uh, and I think that we need to address controversial topics uh, more and more often in the future. This is a controversial yeah. topic. We need to do this more and more often because we need to get trained to tackle these topics and to communicate to others. Now we're all technicians, but if some uh, non-technician non would come out with a very, uh, let's say, nasty question, we might be in difficulty in replying. We need to start being much better in, uh, in challenging absurd things and in communicating uh, uh, how, how good we, we try to do. Okay, so this is just uh, something for the future, but it's an I effort totally that we agree. really no, need I to totally do. agree. So thank you very much uh, again for your, uh, for, for Geolog for hosting this uh, interesting. We have one question from the chat, which is, uh, broadly speaking, what data do you suggest should be gathered by industry and or government to test these models? And or why uh, do you suggest any field tests? OK. Let me distinguish uh, data into, OK. Like I said, I'm going to say it anyway, into two types, laboratory and field scale. Okay. Uh, to me, uh, also in this project, uh, we did actually other colleagues uh, in, uh, did quite a few laboratory experiments uh, to come up with characterization of the processes. So the way fractures are formed, which is still not clear of how to identify them, and the way they interact with the host rock as a function of the rock. This type of tests uh, actually has been conducted in um, Edinburgh, with, uh, with the aid of something, uh, of a new apparatus, uh, which was called the Great Cell. And that I tried to show here, somewhere. Yeah, here. Oops. OK. Where uh, it was a new triaxial, triaxial cell of <coughs> where, uh, uh, where this different degrees of stresses and different types of rocks and form, formation of cracks have been considered. Then there has to be other laboratory scales uh, uh, experiments on uh, two-phase flow and uh, uh, reactive transport. Uh, specifically in this case, uh, it was sorption desorption on the host rock. Uh, Try to come up with uh, an understanding of the model and uncertainty associated with the parameters of the model governing this type of processes. So to me, I can see laboratory experiments of this type and data of this type, uh, which are useful to understand processes and the mathematical tools. To transfer them to field, and then I will come to the, uh, I will come to the field, to the field, uh, to the field part, then uh, we need to perform, uh, well, first of all, proper upscaling, and uh, to do proper upscaling, uh, can I say that it is a mess, uh, even if I'm live? Yes, it's a mess to do proper upscaling. And it really depends on what you mean by upscaling. So not necessarily a model, where by model I mean a mathematical structure which you can find in the lab on the best data that you have, then can be applied exactly with the same format in the field, because it's a different scale in space and time. So between the field and laboratory uh, and laboratory ex the laboratory and field experiments uh, there has to be a strong theoretical basis uh, to join the two of them and that's one point in terms of uh, uh, so i hope i have answered uh, in terms of uh, um, in terms of the uh, as far as the laboratory scale is concerned in terms of uh, field, in terms of field, uh, uh, my point uh, is related uh, to this part here, which is uh, at the very beginning uh, when I talk about the concerns that there are here. So if we are talking about, in any case, uh, to, it really depends on the target uh, that, you, uh, that you want to address. For example, if we are talking, uh, if we are talking about noise, uh, 
Well, if we're talking about noise, maybe we don't need to collect any field data about the groundwater systems. If we're talking about air pollutions, then we need to take data about atmospheric emissions. And we need to, well, not only atmospheric emissions, but we need to collect data, uh, I don't know, from medical variance stations, for example, to come up with uh, uh, velocity of the wind, temperature, and so on. If you need to address uh, the problem of uh, induced seismicity, then, uh, of course, you always need to have a baseline in the system. Then, uh, well, you need uh, quite a few geophysical, geophysical data. So, to me, the type of data to collect, uh, I, I'm not sure that to say as many data as you can is the right answer. To me, it really depends on the question that you want to answer to. Hope I was clear enough because I don't, I'm not sure I have a universal recipe depending on, uh, uh, on the field. But with this type of deconstruction of the problem, then you can understand what are the key parameters driving your system, and then you can understand what field investigations and at what, fee and at what scale to perform to constrain those parameters. For example, in this very simple case, uh, to me, my enemy was uh, the uh, ratio between horizontal and vertical permeability of the overburden. So, if the system were homogeneous, uh, I, would invest, uh, I would invest on a well test, for example. I'm simplifying things, but that's, uh, that's my answer. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we have no other questions, so thank you very okay. much. Now it's time for the question. Thank you.